God, on the day we celebrate our nation's birth, we place our faith in you. You are the one who gives us freedom. You have endowed us with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And may we pursue you with the passion that you first pursued us. As we celebrate our great nation, we remember the sacrifice and turmoil that this country was born out of and that continues to shape us today. We know that you are not done here. We know that we are far from perfect. And we know that you have a plan. We pause to remember that you are our God. And we are the people of your pasture. Help our country turn toward you. Bring revival to this nation. Give our leaders clear vision and sober minds. Bring peace and justice to our schools and unite us all as brothers and sisters. God, we ask that your kingdom would come and come quickly. May peace and prosperity come to your children living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. One nation under God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 91. Psalm 91, I'm going to be reading from the contemporary English version, but here's what it says. Live under the protection of God Most High, and stay in the shadow of God Almighty. Then you will say to the Lord, you are my fortress, my place of safety. You are my God, and I trust you. The Lord will keep you safe from secret traps and from deadly diseases. He will spread his wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or a city wall. I want you to consider with me for a few moments the Pledge of Allegiance and the words of the Pledge of Allegiance as it relates to live under the protection of God. The pledge we all know and know as well, we learned it as children. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. One nation under God, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Now, most of us learn these precious words while yet in grade school, with our hands over our heart and our eyes fixed upon the red, white, and blue. We were told to stand at attention, remembering all of those who had fought for our freedoms that we so enjoyed. As we grew older, we recited these words. We could do them from memory without even giving much thought to them. You know, the Pledge of Allegiance was published in 1892 as a patriotic salute for school children. Though it went through several various revisions through the years, Congress made it official in 1942. One year later, the Supreme Court made it a voluntary pledge for all school children across America. In 1954, when the words under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance, at that time, our nation was in turmoil. It was the time of the Cold War era. Anti-communism and sentiments towards that were at a national all-time high. Americans as a whole, they viewed the Soviet Union as a godless, atheistic monster with a dangerous menace to the whole world. In the midst of the building of bomb shelters at that time and civil defense drills, it was President Dwight D. Eisenhower that saw the nation's need to reaffirm our reliance upon God for our national strength and comfort by placing the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. It was America's way of saying, 
we have made up our minds. We know our roots. We know our helper. We are not polytheistic, nor are we atheistic. We are one nation under God. America, think about it for a moment. Never has there been a nation quite like it. As a nation, our political superstructure has been based upon the bedrock of biblical principles. Our roots are not pagan. They are not Islamic. They are not atheistic. Our nation's roots are sunk deep into God and in his redeeming son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is our book. It is our guiding book. God's hand has clearly been upon America's history. Our national history could be called his story. It is truly the story of God working amongst us here in America and raising up this nation from Plymouth Rock to the Mayflower Compact, the New England Charter, the Constitution of the United States of America. All of these historical documents all make clear and unabashed reference to Almighty God. When you think of our founders like George Washington, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, all of these men clearly saw the providence of God in the events of their day. In the Constitutional Framing Convention, it was Benjamin Franklin that made the following motion for prayer, realizing that this young nation, if it was going to be God's nation, and if it was going to be under his protection, that they would need to pause and pray and seek the face of God before continuing on and framing the Constitution. And here is what Benjamin Franklin had to say. He says, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And it is here that we discover, following this call to prayer, that they drop on their knees and they fall on their faces and they begin to seek God for this young nation and for the constitution that they would begin to develop. America has been blessed then with a rich spiritual heritage. Our nation was begun by God, and the only way it can survive, friends, is with God. It is one nation under God, and that is our place of safety, security, and provision. Now, the question is often asked, what is the source of America's greatness? What makes America the land that it is? In 2017, just uh, four short years ago, George Barna did a poll across the nation, and he asked the question, what is the source of America's greatness? Listen what they found. So what makes America great? This was done June 5 to 9 of the year 2017. And I want you to see, as we look through this list here, how quickly some of these things have changed in just four short years. So the first response was, is an opportunity to become who you want to be was 24%. That is what makes America great. The Constitution, 21%. Free speech, free press, 21%. Freedom of religion, 20%. Democracy, 20%. The Bill of Rights, 14%. A melting pot of society, that is 13%. Christian origins and values, the very foundation of our nation, 11%. Our military strength, 9%. Technology and innovation, 7%. Beauty and the variety of geography and scenery across this beautiful land that God has given to us, 6%. Industrious, entrepreneurial spirit, 4%. Arts and culture, 4%. Economies that is stable, economic stability, 3% and America's relative youth as a nation, 2%. They say these are the things that make America great. And as you begin to look down the list there, 
opportunity to become who you want to be. Thank God that is true in America. The Constitution has been meddled with over the last four years. Free speech and free press, they too have, in many ways, they've denigrated and fallen far from what they once were. Freedom of religion, under attack. And so we look at the list of what makes America great and the responses in this poll in 2017. So what is it then that makes America great? Some would say it's America's land. You know, we're the breadbasket of the world. As you drive through Wisconsin and Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, as you go throughout southern Illinois and into Michigan, as you begin to look in this entire region, you'll discover that we are indeed the center of the breadbasket of the world. And as you look at the very topography, you look at our soil, our soil is fresh and fertile. When you compare it to that of the worn soils of Egypt, of Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, if you begin to look around the world, you'll see that some of these nations where they have lived much longer on the land than what we have here in America, you'll discover their land looks worn, it looks abused, and much used. This land is wonderful. So is that the source of America's greatness, the physical land itself? Others would say it's America's people. America's people are people of a strong work ethic. We're industrious, educated. And they would say, that's what makes America great. Others would say, no, no, it's not that, but it's America's generosity. And thank God, we live in a nation that has been a generous nation to people in need all over this globe. As a nation, we have helped the world. We have built hospitals around the world. We have built highways for them and schools for education. And so the question is, what makes America great? Is it our generosity? And some would say, no, it's not our generosity, but rather it's America's freedoms. We have freedom of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now, friends, all of these are true to some measure, as is all the list that you will find from 2017 from the Barna survey. But the greatness of America is found, friends, I believe, in its founder and life giver, which is God himself. The reason that this land is a great land is because of God. You know, as you travel the world, you find how many view America. I was in a small little community just outside of Amman, Jordan. It was a dusty, impoverished little village. And I stopped in what was just a very kind of a shanty looking building that was the post office. I wanted to buy some stamps and send some postcards back home to the States. And this young man that was working there, this young Jordanian, when he found out that I was from America, his eyes lit up and he said, that is my dream. My dream is one day to go where we can be free. I want to go to America. I want to go there and study. I want to go there and work. And I want to go and help that land to become even a better land. Much of the world dreams of coming to America. When you consider our borders, our U.S. borders aren't stationed, our guards there to keep America, Americans in, but rather to keep those out which would wish to do us harm. Yes, one nation under God, one nation that has been blessed above all others, a nation that we call our home, our land, our very place to hang our hat and say, this is the land that God has given to us. So what makes America great? All of these things in part are true, but none of them would be true if it were not for God and for God's blessing. Secondly, one nation under God. Look at Psalm 91 one more time. Put it on the screen because it comes from a translation that you may not be aware of. The original, I believe you remember the words there. It says, he that, abideth in the, you know, he that abideth in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And they'll say that he is their God. 
Well, this is the translation, live under the protection of God most high and stay in the shadow of God all powerful. Then you will say to the Lord, you are my fortress, my place of safety. You are my God. I trust you. Friends, freedom is the closest thing to the heart of God. God universally stands for liberty and for freedom. History proves that the closer a nation walks with God, the greater the freedom that nation will enjoy. But the opposite of that is true as well. When you look around the globe and you look at the nations that have forgotten God, it is interesting to note how oppressive governments, how they seek to destroy God, because wherever you find God, you find freedom and you find prosperity. And the only way to control these individuals is to remove and to wipe away all knowledge of God in their culture. In Scripture, as you begin to read through the pages of the Bible, you'll discover that whenever Israel abandoned God, they lost their freedom. When they abandoned God, the Babylonians came in. When it was in that moment when they had abandoned God, you'll discover that God allowed some outside force each and every time to come in to chastise and to take over the land of Israel. Now, I believe that Israel and the United States of America have a lot in common today. I believe that God brought both of us out of bondage to proclaim the blessings of God to a lost world. We must return, friends, a nation and our nation must return to being one nation under God. Our safety is under God. Our blessing is under God. Our leadership must be under God. And what a wonderful and secure place it is when you are living and enjoying that place under God. One nation under God. Now, friends, as you begin to look around, you'll begin to see that America is under attack. It is under attack, sadly, not from without, as much as it is from within. Everything this nation has stood for for 245 years, I believe, is now under attack. And the most vicious of these attacks are not coming from some foreign terrorist group covertly that is working against us, Rather, the most insidious of these attacks are coming from within and from our own liberal court system. Legislating from the bench, friends, is a dangerous precedent. Courts are to interpret and not to legislate law. Sad to say, many of the key court cases of our day relate directly to religious freedoms. The Bible, prayer, Christmas, In God we trust on our money, and one nation under God in our pledge. They tell me there is nearly 6,000 in whether it's local, state, or national courts today, 6,000 different cases that are in some level of being litigated as it relates to religious freedom. 6,000, think about it. Now let me give you just a quick sample of what has taken place across America, first in our schools. The removal of student prayer. It was June the 26th of 1962 that the Supreme Court banned the New York State school prayer. Now you say, New York school prayer, what is this school prayer? Every day, students following the Pledge of Allegiance, they would pray this prayer, and it was a prayer for their nation, for the nation, and for their school and so on. Let me give it to you exactly the way they were to pray it. So think about this now. Every day as you started out school, first thing they would do, hand over heart, facing the flag, and they would do the pledge to the flag of the United States. And then they would say, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessing upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. June 26th of 1962, the Supreme Court banned New York State from allowing this prayer to be prayed in the classroom. When you look at that prayer, 
Almighty God, we acknowledge your dependence upon thee. That sounds pretty good to me. And we beg thy blessing upon us as individual students, upon our parents, upon our teachers, and upon our country. And it was declared that it was forcing religion upon others, and therefore it was struck down. The removal of invocations and benedictions in schools and school activities followed soon thereafter. There were many times when you think back over the years that a major gathering, whether it was graduation or something similar to that, a convocation of some kind in the college or in the schools, high schools and even grade schools, there would be an invocation by a local pastor and another one that would be a benediction, the blessing of God as they would get ready to leave that facility for the evening. And that too has been removed. The removal of public school Bible reading has been banned from America. Here's what they said when they struck it down. I want you to listen to the wording. If portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and have been psychologically harmful to the child. Now, friends, I believe all the psychological damage that could happen, the least of it is what we need to worry about coming from God's Word in the reading of the New Testament. That's a time for you to go like that. It is time for us to realize how slow but sure we have been robbed of our rights, we've been robbed of our history with God. A kindergarten student wanted to read the story of the first Christmas as his class project. The class project was favorite story month assignment. The teacher and the principal properly told the kindergartner that the books about God were not allowed in school. At the New York school, a young boy was instructed not to mention or write about God in any of his classwork. In Georgia, a young girl was told not to write a biography of Jesus. A fourth grader in California was warned that he could not write a book report on anything that included Bible or religion. An elementary school student in Missouri was disciplined for daring to pray over his lunch at noon. In Alaska, public students, students were told they could not use the word Christmas in school because it had the word Christ in it, nor could they have the word in their notebooks or exchange Christmas cards or presents or display anything with the word Christmas on it. Prayer and Bible reading have been banned in our schools. The Ten Commandments have been removed from our public buildings. Cities have been sued for having Christian symbols. Even our own, you know, city here of of uh, Wauwatosa. Wauwatosa used to have on their police cars and everywhere else, all their insignia always included the cross and they were sued to remove it. Cities are being sued for having Christian, Christian symbols. And God is not wanted, not wanted anywhere in the public space. You can do what you want behind closed doors and worshiping God, talking about God, reading the Bible, praying to God, but leave it inside. Do not bring it into the public square. Charles Colson, in his book, Why America Doesn't Work, said, courts strike down even perfunctory prayer and were surprised that schools bristling with barbed wire look more like prisons than prisons do. Universities reject the very idea of truth and were shocked when the best of their graduates loot and betray. Celebrities mock the traditional family and were appalled at the tragedy of broken homes and millions of unwed mothers. The media embraces sex without responsibility and were horrified by sexual plagues. Politicians justify the taking of innocent life in a sterile clinic and were terrified by the disregard of life in the blood-soaked streets of America. C.S. Lewis described this irony in a generation, a generation ago when he said, we laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. 
Friends, what makes America great? It is God. Historically, what has been our key to national success? It is God. One nation under God. That's the place I long to be and to live, under the shadow of the Almighty, and to know the blessing, the protection, and the care of God over this land. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, if they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. He will forgive our sin, he said, and I will heal your land. Possibly in the house today, you're saying, I can see what's happened in America. I can see the further we drift away from our God underpinnings, our foundation in God, the less freedoms, the, fresh, the less joy, the less peace, the less we have in this land that we call our own, this land we call America. But also, I believe there are those in the room this morning that are saying, you know, I, I get this, the importance of the nation being under God. He was the life giver of the nation. He's been our sustainer. I get it that America needs to be under, under the blessing of God, one nation under God. But you're beginning to realize that your life, your life has not been under, under God. Like the nation, you've been just kind of, you know, day by day, you've been beating your head against the wall. You're trying to do the best you can, do it on your own. And God is standing alongside saying, we acknowledge me. We allow me to bless your life. We allow me to, to cause you to rise up and become everything I created you to be. See, God had a plan when he created your life. The Bible tells us of the prophet Jeremiah, even before he was conceived, the Bible says God knew him. Before you were ever born, before you ever took your first breath, God knew you, and the Bible knew exactly what your plan was for your life, and he's been trying to orchestrate your life, not to control you some, you know, forcible way, but he's been trying to guide you into life, life that is full, a life that is under his, his wings, protected. I remember vividly the story that I was told as a child, and you know, kids' church, hundred years ago almost now. But in that kid's church, I remember them telling the story of a, of a hen. And this mother hen took the little chicks and had them under, under her body, protecting them there. And a raging fire quickly came through, a grass fire. And yes, the mother hen died, but under was the life of the little chicks, and they started coming out after the flames had cooled. It was a place of safety and protection. Friend, let me tell you, I wouldn't want to walk out these doors. I want to, want to drive on a highway. I wouldn't want to live one second without God, without his blessing, without his protection. And the Bible says we can live, we can live under his wings. The picture of that hen with the little chicks underneath. It's the mighty wings of God, the arms of God. He said, will you come? Will you come and come close to me? Will you come and allow me to shelter you? Will you allow me to protect you? Will you allow me to provide for you? Will you allow me? That's the question of the hour. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Father, I pray. Lord, just as a nation can only exist and a nation can only be truly blessed, as the word tells us in the Psalms, blessed is the nation whose Lord is God. I ask, O oh God, that you would be our nation's God. 
You gave us our life as a nation. Out of all the nations on this planet, we've been most blessed to live here. Most of us were born here. Others have, by choice, come from nations around the world, and they have become part of us. And we are one, one nation under God. Lord, I pray we would be that. And I pray, oh God, for those that are in the room right now that are saying, now I understand why it's really not fully working for me. I've not been under God. I've been trying to do it on my own. And I've even pushed him away at times when I thought all he wanted to do is interfere with my joy and with my life when he really wanted to bring me freedom. He wanted to bring me joy. He wanted to preserve my life. He wanted to protect my life. And he even had a plan that was out of this world that one day I could spend all of eternity with him in heaven. And today I realize that I've not been under, under God but I want to come into that place with heads bowed and eyes closed. As I conclude this prayer, how many would say today, Pastor, will you include me in this prayer? I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I want to come under him. I'm tired. I'm weary of trying to do this thing on my own. And I've discovered that that is why I was created, to have a relationship with God. And I want to live in that relationship. And I want to come into that place where I'm under his cover, under his wings, under his blessing, under his forgiveness, under his protection. I want to come into that place today. Pastor, pray for me. Let me see your hands up real high all over this room. God bless you. God bless you and you. How many others today? God bless you in the far back over here. God bless you in the far back and my far left. God bless you, hon, right down here, in the center row, the outside edge. How many others? All over this room, God bless you in the balcony. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer, and I want you to make this prayer your own. And as I pray it, you just take these words, and only they're just gonna help you to connect. But make these prayer, this prayer your own. Just say, Father, Thank you for your incredible love. Thank you for giving me natural life, physical life. Thank you, Lord, for the way you've protected me. Even in times when the enemy would have tried to done harm or take me out. Even in those moments when I've been living without you and even at times of living in rebellion, you have preserved my very life. This morning, however, I'm coming to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Make that prayer personal. Say, forgive me, God. Forgive me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross in my place. Thank you for shedding your life's blood for me so that I could have a relationship with you and with the Father that I could come under your leadership, under your blessings. I give you my life this morning. I give you all of my past. I've made a mess of things trying to do it on my own. I've sinned. But I turned from that sin this morning, and I'm running to you, and I'm asking you to be my, my Savior, be my God, be my protector. Be my provision. I come to you, and I declare this morning with my mouth, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Just say that right where you're at. Jesus Christ is my Lord. For the word says, we believe in our heart, but we confess with our mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. And I pray, oh God, for each one of these that have just prayed that prayer. I ask, oh God, this would be a brand new beginning for them. I pray, oh God, they would sense a brand new start. I pray that they would sense this is the reboot. This is the moment of new life, a new start, new hopes, new dreams. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and are of God. And we thank you, Lord, that we can live under, under you and under your protection. I pray, oh God, that you guide them and direct them. And I pray that each one of these friends, before the day is over, they would tell someone that they would have the courage to say, I don't care what the world says. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my God. And I live my life under the domination, under the blessing, under the one that created me, under God. I'm one life under God. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the difference you're making. I invite everyone in the house to stand with me now. And I want you to join me as we begin to pray for America, pray for this land that we love so desperately. I want you to pray right where you're at. You just offer up your own prayers to him. A blessing upon America. Father, this morning we call out to you. We know you're the life giver. You're the one that gave life to us. And you're the one that birthed this nation. If a sparrow cannot fall from its nest without you noticing, it is impossible for a nation to arise without your notice. And I ask, oh God, that your hand would be upon America. Father, we ask for forgiveness. Lord, we have drifted. We've allowed things to happen under our watch that should have never taken place. We ask, oh God, you'd forgive us. Forgive us for our national sins. Forgive us from drifting from away from the place that you would have for us of security and safety. And Lord, we know the farther we drift, the less freedom we have, and we can see it already. And we ask, oh God, there'd be a turnaround. There'd be repentance in America. And rather than running from God, Help us to run fast and hard to you while there's still time. We ask, oh God, that you'd move in America. Forgive us of our sins, oh God. Forgive us, oh God, for our self-sufficiency. Forgive us, oh God, for our self-pride. Let our sufficiency be in God. Let our pride be in the God that gave us life and has given us freedom. I ask, O oh God, that you would bless America. Grip us, O oh God, that we are the ones to pray. Those that are in this nation that know you not, seldom will they pray. It's upon us. It is our responsibility to call out for our nation. God, I pray that from the White House to the State House, Lord, to all city and local governments, I pray, oh God, that all would bow like they did at the Congress when they were writing and penning the very words of the Constitution, that they would seek your face and that we'd hear your, your voice, oh God, in this hour as a nation. I pray, oh God, on this day, where there's gonna be many celebrations and there will be a lot of good food and family gatherings and parades and there's gonna be fireworks and the whole business. God, in the midst of it all, let us not forget this day has been set aside so that we'd remember where you brought us from, what you've made of us and what your will and desire is for this nation. Pray you bless, bless this nation. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon this day. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. And every child of God said, amen. God bless you all. And God bless America, one nation under God.